Hey, this is Eric. We're here at Revel 8 HQ in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, I'm here with Kurt Ref Snyder and Hugh Oliver, who are doing some cool adventures on the Iditarod Trail this week. And uh, we're fortunate enough to have them here in our shop. Uh, they've both been Revel 8 ambassadors for a long time. And uh, just thought we'd have them in here and ask them a few questions. Um, so, Hugh, you first. Um, yeah. <laughs> What are you most excited about? Um, probably just the, like the scale of the landscape. I, I guess you guys are pretty used to it, but the idea, <laughs> the idea that you can just travel for hundreds of miles and not not see very much, you know, like get to the big city of McGrath at the end is, is like amazing. It blows my mind. The big city, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> McGrath is three hundred people. Uh, just <laughs> FYI, uh, yeah, awesome. And so the route goes through the Alaska Range. Have you ever? You've been to Alaska before, right? Yeah, yeah, been to Alaska and drove up to Fairbanks. Um, was super excited to see Denali, and obviously it was super cloudy, so <laughs> still super excited to see Denali. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, what are you kind of most nervous about getting into the race, going into the race? Um, I think just, again, like the good bits can be the bad bits as well, so the scale is really exciting, but the scale is also pretty intimidating. So... Um, just the fact that you can be a real long way from help and you really do need to sort it out. Like, you know, the safety net is very, very far away. So um, the race bit is quite far down my list of priorities. Like, I want to move fast, but kind of have fun and enjoy it. But, you know, very much like riding within yourself, like a big big margin of safety. Mm -hmm. I want to yeah. keep that <laughs> at all times. Totally, yeah. Um, kind of coming from the UK, like, how, uh, how did you kind of um, go about preparing and training for this because it's such a different environment and usually, usually at least um, yeah yeah it's a lot warmer here <laughs> um, sometimes no it, it feels weird because we've had like a not a terrible winter but it hasn't been very cold hasn't been very snowy so I thought I would get out on a few fat bike rides but the two or three days when the fat biking would have been good it was also good skiing so I went skiing instead um, <laughs> so a lot of it is kind of drawing on past experience which you know the last big winter trip I did was three years ago so just kind of, it feels a bit weird packing stuff that I haven't used in that way for a while, but just knowing it worked then is what will work now. Like quite and a lot. And those of, were what, like Greenland and you did a Yeah, Greenland Swedish in Arctic. 2020. And uh, the Swedish Arctic was like a couple of years before that. Um, and then obviously in 2019, I lived in um, just outside Banff in mm -hmm. Canada. So I had a really good winter fat biking. So it, it feels weird just like trusting your, trusting stuff that you know works from three years ago, but. It, it'll be fine yeah yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it'll be fine yeah. it has to be fine <laughs> yeah I think a lot of the the ITI is having just multi-day winter experience under your belt and, yeah, yeah I guess trusting that that first day and first night it'll it'll come back mm -hmm. yeah yeah and you just sort of get into a rhythm of it so yeah. I, yeah I guess like not being in such a rush that you don't get a chance to get back into a rhythm of it yeah is my plan be zen yeah <laughs> about the whole winter thing yeah <laughs> How'd you kind of go about like getting bike and food stuff prepped for this since you're traveling like cross oceans and stuff like that? Oh man, it's been like the biggest logistical faff of my <laughs> life. It's been amazing. I think the first thing I did was um, ship myself drop bags. So the two drop bags that we get on the 350 route, um, I had to ship, ship them from Scotland like a month ago. I'm pretty sure they're here in Alaska. <laughs> They've been delivered, so they, they're in Alaska somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a, like a, a funny one to get sorted out. Obviously, we're really lucky. There is there is some kind of infrastructure on the race, so um, food at checkpoints and food uh, mm -hmm. roadhouses. So actually, if you break it down into chunks, it's not that far between food. Um, but yeah, just the whole. Every time I think I've got everything dialed, you remember a whole extra thing that you've forgotten about while you were distracted <laughs> with the other thing. You're like, oh yeah, you need to sort that out too. So just like chasing my tail. Um, I'm not very good. Kurt's really good at spreadsheets. I'm super, <laughs> super organized. And I, I aspire to be that organized. But I think, I think in reality, I just have a running commentary in my head. Like, have you done that? No. Okay, you should do that. <laughs> but it, it works out. Yeah, that's the kind of way I roll. Like, I, I have too many spreadsheets in my life that when I want to do a trip, I don't really do any spreadsheets at all. <laughs> <laughs> I've got mental spreadsheets. Yeah. Cool. Um, so... Yeah, so Hugh did a cool uh, gear video that we have online, so we'll link to that. Um, but yeah, so Kurt, you're here and you're going to bike, you're going to tour the Editor Trail mm -hmm. for, um, well, 
the Sitna River, basically to, to know him the whole way. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Um, yeah, I'm nervous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So basically self-supported, you've, you've shipped, well, tell us what you've done. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, starting, so I'm starting a little different place than where the race is, um, just to try to cover some miles a little more quickly on the first day. And the big difference touring the route is that you don't get that bit of race infrastructure. So you don't get draw bags and they're like, you don't get checkpoint food along the way. So there's a few lodges with food in the first 250 miles or so. And that's it. So I've got a week's worth of food packed, which hopefully it's like six days of riding. I can get a few meals along the way and then have like a day and a half of extra food just in case. And then beyond that shipped, uh, more boxes to uh, post offices with like five days of food at a time. So hopefully, I don't know, you still need to keep moving quickly to like stay ahead of the tail end of the sled dog race that starts uh, in like a week from now because once the last sled dogs pass through, sections of the trail don't really see any traffic and they start to deteriorate. So still hoping to do like 50 miles a day and sleep a good amount each night. Yeah, that's a pretty unique thing about the Editorod Trail is it's a natural historic trail but it's only really exists for this really tight window uh, of time. It's super unique in that. Yeah, you get regard. like a month to work with right. kind of thing from yeah. the a snowmobile race that's just finishing in the next like two days, mm-hmm. I think it wraps up. And then the sled dog race, which starts in a week or so yeah. and takes a dozen days or something, I think, for the tail end of that field to make it to Nome. It blows my mind, though, that there's this trail, like a little, <laughs> a little stinky <laughs> bit of winter trail that you can take from Anchorage to Nome, like... It, it might only be little, but it goes all the way across Alaska. Yeah, all the way. All the way. Like bunk. That's why I'm back. I tried to ride it. So cool. What, three years ago, I guess, as, as the pandemic hit. And uh, I was riding with Nicholas Carmen, and we ended up getting shut down as COVID reached Alaska, and the native village is all closed to outsiders, so we couldn't get our drop boxes for, with food for that ride. And just that concept of a trail that exists for a month, like, yeah, really want to come back and experience the whole thing. Yeah, so. awesome. Um you're one of the founders of bikepacking routes and you've you're like you know demigod of bikepacking routes <laughs> frankly it's so it's like can you maybe just tell us like what things you know as you've prepared for this like what similarities have you found that might be similar to just a normal bikepacking trip you know or yeah yeah i mean the, the self-supported nature of it or the fact that you're just on your own in between communities is just like anywhere else i think the big difference though is that the consequences of something going wrong and what I mean what margin of error you have and what the safety net or lack thereof is like there is no shortcut you can take or like bail off to a city or something like that or bail off to a bike shop I think that's the big difference in all of it but the similarity is it's like a very set route which you know kind of like the right ride mountain bike route for example and that's what you follow and you know along the way where there's places to resupply and I think you can get a good estimate, at least if conditions are reasonable, for how long it'll take to get there and then add in a cushion of, if things go badly, you bring two days extra food or something like that. And so it's just bounce from community to community like that and reset when you get there and figure out what you need for the next bit. And Yeah. Yeah, can you think of, like, what kind of weird, since you're doing this whole trip on your own and you've figured it out on your own, like, what kind of weird Alaska logistical stuff have you had to figure out? <laughs> Well, one, getting to the start, Hugh is going to help me get up there tomorrow with Eric's truck, okay, good. which if that's okay with you, Eric. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no so that's a little bit of a challenge. I think just the, I mean, the uncertainty in weather forecasts and just, mm. you know, don't know what it's going to be like. You can look at the forecast and it might say one thing and you still don't know if it's going to do that. And so just needing to be super flexible with that because you are so far out there um, compared to a lot of places. And the... I think just like in the towns, the, the lack of services, like you can get to some of these native villages and there isn't a restaurant and there is a store, but the hours are limited and there is a post office, but the hours are limited and there may not be anywhere to like any kind of restaurant or anything. So mm-hmm. pretty limited resources in those places. So that's another challenge just based on their size. Yeah. Um, you know, you're based in Arizona and here we are in Alaska. Um, <laughs> And I saw that you're, you know, riding desert dirt, you know, not a couple biking, days ago. I, I kind of overheated. Like yeah. I and you're was struggling in the heat a little bit. Yeah. So like, <laughs> how did you, how do how do you wrap your head around completely shifting environment to, you know, riding through I snow? Think, I mean, month. like yeah. Hugh was saying about leaning on knowledge and experience from the past. That's definitely what I'm doing here is I mm-hmm. came up three years ago for the ITI and then some touring after that. And 
I learned a ton. Things worked out well enough with that. And so I was able to make some changes to my systems based on what I learned in that and what worked well and what I was kind of concerned about potentially not working well once I was here. And I mean, I haven't, have I ridden on snow? I've ridden, I've done a couple short rides <laughs> on snow this winter, like 45 minutes in the mountains near my house up to a summit. And I haven't really spent much time in winter this year. So definitely leaning on that past experience. Cool. Having raced the trail once and doing really well and going really fast in it, um, what are you most looking forward to now that you're going to tour it? Yeah, I'm look, I think just seeing more, looking around more. Last time I was so focused on myself and my systems and not being particularly comfortable in that kind of winter environment and especially racing in that those kind of conditions. I was just trying to make sure I didn't make any big mistakes with self-care and all of that. And so I didn't spend a lot of time looking around and also spent so much time moving in the dark. Um, so getting a better feel for the big landscape and that what you mentioned earlier about landscapes, like that's a huge inspiration for me also and just the scale of them. Um, and then going over the Alaska range last time I was going through that with Clint in the dark at like 1am or 2am in 50 mile an hour winds and we couldn't see anything. Uh, so just being able to enjoy that and see these massive mountains, uh, that you're passing through, that's I'm really excited for that. And then also beyond that, once the sled dog race catches up, seeing the mushers in action and seeing the teams, that's super cool. Yeah. So, that'll really break it up for yeah. sure. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks you guys for spending some time here. And, yeah. Uh, thanks for having us. Yeah. Uh, Good luck to you both on your big trips. (laughs) Thanks. Thanks.